Welcome to Transform Now, the podcast brought to you by robotic process automation pioneer, SSNC Blue Prism. Digital transformation has the potential to reshape the way companies service their customers, engage their employees, and manage their operations. Whether you're looking to develop strategies, tactics, or best practices to positively impact the future of work, or you're curious to see how other companies have successfully navigated their digital transformation programs, then this podcast is for you. We're here to help you transform now. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Marchek, and welcome to the Transform Now podcast. I want to thank you for joining part one of this two-part episode. On this part of the episode, we'll have a flock of guests. I don't know how to describe it, but we have quite a few guests on our show today who have all contributed to a white paper called Going Green with Digital Workers. But it's not about green with envy. It's about ESG, or Environment, Social, and Governance, which has become a very hot topic. You see what I did there? You know, hot with climate change and all. Okay, no more dad jokes. We'll be chatting with Brad Hairston, Thomas Richter, and Drew Sondon from Blue Prism, along with our esteemed partner, Michael Herrick, from the globally renowned management consulting firm of Bain & Company. We have a lot of really interesting things to chat about on this episode, but before we get started, let's find out more about our guests. Michael, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background? Sure. Hi, this is uh, Michael Herrick. I'm a partner with Bain & Company, a leading management consulting firm. I'm based in New York. And I lead our automation practice for Bain globally. Great to be here, Michael. Thomas, why don't you go next? Hello, I'm Thomas Richter from Blue Prism. I'm the head of uh, manufacturing industries. And uh, I see myself as a bridge builder between the technology, especially when it comes to intelligent automation. And the business side, I have more than 15 years practice in the industry itself. Also 15 years as well as an advisor to leading companies. Thanks, Thomas. And Drew? Hey guys, so I'm Drew Sogden. I'm a senior solutions consultant here at Blue Prism with a particular interest in the product vertical. I've been delivering intelligent automation for clients for the last four years, I guess, but digital transformation more broadly for the last 15. It's really exciting to now see ESG becoming a core part of the value proposition. I would agree with that. And finally, Brad, usually you're on the other side of the microphone, as you say, uh, but today you're <laughs> one of our guests. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Brad Hairston, based in Dallas, Texas. I've been with Blue Prism about three and a half years. I manage our relationships with the top advisory firms, such as Bain. And prior to Blue Prism, I spent about 30 years in the consulting industry. And as Michael mentioned, I am also a host of the Transform Now podcast. So it is really nice to be a guest this time around. Fantastic. Well, Brad, while we're, we're started here, let's go back to you about this paper. So what motivated all of you to co-author a paper on the impact of intelligent automation in the environmental sustainability space? Because as I think about it, I think about robots, I don't think about the environment. So maybe you can help kind of guide me through that. Well, Michael, as you said in your opening, ESG is a hot topic <laughs> these days. And if you just consider the E part of, of that, the environmental, which is really the focus of this paper, it's an even hotter topic. And climate change is everywhere. It's being talked about almost everywhere you look. And I live in Texas where we're having one of the hottest summers on record. And you can bet they're talking about how climate change is going to make that a more common occurrence. There are also fires burning in the western part of the U.S. that they have labeled as uncontrollable. They're saying we can't even stop them. We're just going to have to wait until they burn out. I mean, that's that's how severe they are. And again, they're predicting that these are going to happen with more regularity due to changes in the climate. But all of that is just pointing out the obvious. If you redirect your attention to the business world, what you see is that the number of stakeholders who care about the environment and care about what companies are doing toward the environment is growing rapidly. Customers, shareholders, potential investors, watchdog groups, et cetera. It's not a topic that companies, no matter what industry they're in, can ignore. So with that backdrop, we started thinking about intelligent automation, which has become so pervasive. In fact, I saw a report just yesterday that Gardner is saying by the end of this year, 2022, 90% of organizations will be using automation in some form or fashion. So it's everywhere you look. Well, we began paying attention to the many ways that digital workers can make a positive impact on the environment and the connection 
between automation and sustainability is much stronger than you might think. And even better, we at Blue Prism, we have customer stories and partner solutions that relate to this, many of which we wove into the papers. So that's what inspired the paper. And I had the benefit of collaborating with this incredible group of co-authors from Blue Prism and Bain, all of whom are equally passionate about this topic. It was a lot of fun. And I think we ended up with a good piece of content. Well, that's excellent. We're look, looking forward to making all those dots get connected uh, as we go through this uh, today. So Thomas, you're the Blue Prism manufacturing leader for EMEA. Let me ask you, as a co-author, is this white paper just targeted at manufacturers? No, it isn't, of course. Um, on the one side, let's say manufacturing is a high diversified and, and a still growing ecosystem where many new players, startups, new entries will join, of course with traditional manufacturers like automotive, discrete manufacturers, high techs, consumer goods, pharmaceutical, metex, chemistry, oil and gas, name it. But even utilities, for example, or transportation, telecommunication, healthcare, and life science business will merge with these ecosystems. And each player is collaborating across the entire value and supply chain. And here it becomes high relevant for ESG targets and so-called circular economy issues, all of these ecosystem players are named owning a part or being involved within this circular economy value chain. And each of these of them, they leaving an, let's say, ecological and environmental carbon footprint, which of course we need to know to, to track and to record. Yeah, I think just to add to what Thomas has said that every organization has a carbon footprint of some sort. It doesn't matter what industry they're in. And if we can find a way to support them in reducing that through the use of intelligent automation, then all the better. Michael, I know that Bain has been do doing a lot of research on a bunch of different subjects. ESG is one of them. But most recently, there was some research that Bain had done about how companies are doing with their sustainability objectives. What did your research find as you, as you looked into that? Good question, Michael. I would say a few things. First, before diving into the research, I would just say we, Bain, obviously are very committed to this topic around ESG. For example, back in 2015, we established a commitment to invest over a billion dollars in pro bono consulting just on this topic over 10 years. And we've already invested over $500 million in supporting various organizations on this particular topic. We've created a dedicated practice just around sustainability and corporate responsibility and a DE&I practice as well to support clients. And we've supported clients across over 500 projects globally. And so with all of this work and us as a firm, we're also committed to being carbon neutral and we've actually achieved that now as well. And so obviously this is a really important topic for us as a firm and for our clients. And so part of this recent research was really to understand how are we doing so far? How are companies doing in the journey around ESG? And so the research that you're referring to that we mentioned in the article is really around decarbonization. And many clients have, or many companies rather, I should say, have set pretty ambitious targets around carbon emissions, for example. And so we really wanted to understand how well companies are doing. And we partnered with this research with a company or a nonprofit called CDP. And what we discovered is if you look at just the 2020 targets, you know, only about 31% of businesses who have set and published scope one and, and scope two absolute emission reduction targets due to in 2020, actually, you know, 30% of them actually did not meet them. And then more than a quarter missed these targets by a substantial margin, probably below 80% of their targets. So what this means is that it's one thing to set targets and it's another thing to sort of deliver it. I think the good news is though, that what we also discovered is many companies are really setting very specific science-based targets. So not just broad goals, broad qualitative goals, but actually science-based targets. And for example, from just 2020 to April 22 of this particular year, you've seen a fourfold increase, for example, around the number of companies actually setting science-based targets. So I think companies are becoming much more specific, much more quantitative in terms of setting targets. Now the real issue is, you know, really shifting from talking about targets or setting targets to actually delivering on them. 
you talk about a science-based target for environmental impact for a company, what does that look like? Well, I mean, it's setting just very specific metrics around reduction targets. So not just saying, hey, we're going to be carbon neutral, if you will, but actually setting, you know, just very specific targets, very quantitative targets. And so it could be a range of things of what that actually means, not just setting broad statements, but actually setting very specific goals. And you see this more for actually European-based companies, as opposed to say U.S.-based companies. That's starting to change, but you know, this is an area where I think Europe has really made strides. They've really been the leaders or the early movers in this particular area. Very interesting. So Drew, the white paper does a really good job of showing how some of the key value drivers for intelligent automation have both commercial benefit and an environmental benefit. I was hoping you could expand on that a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess from my perspective, one of the key benefits of intelligent automation is its ability to connect business functions together. You know, if you take an example from the telco industry, the ability to connect engineering to customer experience to deliver something that offers more end-to-end -end improvement in, in, in the process is uh, something that's really shifted the paradigm in that industry. From an ESG perspective, uh, as Michael's just said, we have a lot of organizations who are looking at their green goals from the ground up. They're exploring from a pure ESG perspective how they can improve, how they can uh, drive the improvements that they see in the way that they deliver their products and services. Now, intelligent automation in general is a process efficiency solution. It allows us to deliver our operations more effectively, more efficiently, more accurately, more speedily, you know, whichever metric you want to look at, and particularly in the manufacturing space, but also across business verticals, if you are doing something more efficiently, then by default, you are going to be doing it in a greater fashion because you're using less raw materials, fewer raw materials, you're employing or utilizing fewer people and the associated carbon footprint that they have, you're using less office space, maybe. So. Actually, a lot of organizations that are already utilizing intelligent automation to reduce the overall time and complexity of their operational processes are already delivering on their green goals by default. If we take a specific client example, in the UK, we work with an organization called Shop Direct. They're one of the UK's largest online retailers. And an automation they delivered some time ago allowed them to more effectively load their outbound logistics capacity. So as they had trucks arriving at the warehouse and they're selling everything from bangles to TVs, the Blue Prism Intelligent Automation Solution is working out the best way to load those trucks so that we get maximum capacity and maximum efficiency in delivery. Now up front, what that's doing for shop direct is this meaning that the warehouse operates more effectively. It's meaning that the cost of logistics for them is lower. It's meaning their cost or, or it means that their customer experience is high because they're delivering stuff more quickly. But it also means there are fewer trucks on the road. So immediately their carbon footprint goes down because we're emitting less fumes from those trucks. We're shedding less rubber onto the roads. And you can see how there's a direct correlation therefore between that efficiency and the ESG agenda. And even in other verticals, if we take a look at financial services, for example, there's a big thing in data heavy industries at the moment about the carbon footprint of data centers. It, it costs a lot of money to keep those big servers cool, to keep them running efficiently. And so organizations are starting now to understand that they need to reduce their processing, their storage, if they want to tackle their carbon footprint. So if you imagine an insurance firm that's grown by acquisition, you know, maybe they've absorbed 30 or 40 smaller firms and across those firms, they've actually got hundreds, thousands, millions, potentially of duplicate customer records from people that have bought insurance for pets, for cars, for owners. Using intelligent automation, we can look through those different repositories and we can build a consolidated single source of truth for each of those customers, which means we can reduce the amount of storage required, reduce the amount of computing power, and therefore reduce carbon footprint from a data storage perspective. And for each individual firm, the overall reduction might be relatively small, but it's kind of like say to individuals, you need to turn light bulbs off on your house. If everybody does it, we can make a massive saving. Absolutely. 
So I know we've talked about data centers, and there have been several major cloud providers who've made commitments to doing more green energy to power those data centers. So moving to the cloud could actually be part of the goal of reducing your overall carbon footprint. Now, Thomas, I know that prior to Blue Prism, you spent some time in that renewable energy industry. How is intelligent automation relevant to green energy? Yeah, yes, of course. It's it's a very good it's a very good point. By the way, I really love this industry and I'm very passionate about this. And over two decades I'm used to work within this industry during my industry time as well as an advisor to leading companies in that space. But Mike, let me answer your question how relevant well it is. It at the end it's all about sustainability. What I've experienced as the early two thousands becoming a real booming decade for renewable energy technologies. And of course, particularly the wind energy business has shown annual growth rates by more than 30 up to 40%. But it was even an age of emerging new technologies. The maturity and sustainability of these technologies were not as competitive in terms of total cost of ownership compared to traditional carbon-based energy supplies. At the end, it was all about the total costs per kilowatt. And on the one side, the industry had to design and to build more robust technologies on a much lower cost base, of course. So mid of the 2000s, you had, for example, you had to invest between 1.2 and 1.5 million US dollar per wind turbine with an average performance of 1.3 megawatt. A few years later, the invest drops significant down below 1 million. But what happened at the same time due to the limited space for onshore turbines, offshore wind parks installing wind turbines on the seaside becoming a significant growing part of the business. Again, with new challenges from a technological perspective, but also for the ramp up of an offshore wind park and its maintenance. And I think here comes intelligent automation or workforce automation on the plan. A maintenance case on an offshore wind park is a real high expensive scenario. Just think about the logistics to reach the farm and executing a maintenance case is a very complex task. And due to the changing weather conditions, sometimes not every time possible, you need really to precise to plan, to schedule, and to manage a huge supply chain with skilled, well-trained and expensive workforce to execute such a maintenance case in such a really harsh environment. So every maintenance case is, is like a box stop in Formula One. It's all about fast turnaround, getting the expensive equipment fast back into the operations. And the objective is to provide lowest downtimes, highest availability really matters in that business. Matters in terms of its competitiveness, but also in terms of its sustainability, particularly compared to other energy resources. But what we have learned and is another indication where we need to think end to end. Today, all wind farms, of course, and its population of wind turbines in the world are equipped with high-tech analytics, condition monitoring and SCADA system. They all have the capability to deliver in, in real time, great and important insights, what's needed to do to avoid downtimes. But at the end, you need to turn all these insights into real actions and execute the job in the most effective way to bring the assets fast back into the operations. And this is where intelligent workforce automation becoming a real crucial success factor for improved TCO and make renewable energy competitive and sustainability against as a resource, especially old technologies. I think Thomas raises just a great point here, which is like analytics is critical in terms of this journey around ESG. And the only way you're going to do good analytics is if you have high quality data. And a lot of this data is becoming more and more fragmented and distributed, right? And the volumes of data are enormous. And getting all of that data into a digestible format quickly so that you can actually perform these analytics without automation, I, you know, I don't see how you actually do that efficiently and in real time, most importantly, so you can actually make changes that are really going to have an environmental impact. So I think automation is a critical enabler for a lot of these other digital technologies that, that we talk about every day in terms of powering 
you know, ESG outcomes. You're absolutely right, Michael. And it's the step beyond that, because if we use the intelligent automation, not only can we support the collation and production of these analytics, but we can also act on them immediately as well. And that's the really crucial thing. It's not the case that we're looking at our, our distributed uh, green energy production landscape and an understanding that a wind turbine here has a, a failing alternator or a solar panel here is, is down in capacity. It's the ability for intelligent automation to use that data to say we need to book an engineer or the cleaning roads needs to be updated. So humans, even if they're presented with a large volume of cleaned up data, are not great at processing it. And we can use the digital workforce to support that as well. I think it's a very important point. At the end, we need to think the journey, like this example of the maintenance case, which is extremely expensive scenario for these companies. We need to think the, the story end to end. At the end, the job needs to get done and uh, to make the most value out of the data. And uh, I don't think it's to execute the job and to orchestrate the work, maybe work which we are not used to do before. I really appreciate Thomas's passion for keeping the wind farms running because in Texas, where I live, a pretty large percentage of our energy production is from wind farms. Uh, yeah, this hits home with me. And that may surprise many of you with our oil and gas heritage <laughs> in Texas. <laughs> But it's true. And, and, and by the way, oil and gas is another form of resource. But when you look at the downstream business for the oil and gas industry, it's all about fast turnaround and bring the assets fast back into the operations and how to manage the things end to end. So we've been talking a lot about the commercial operations of some of the wind farms, et cetera. But Drew mentioned something which I think is becoming far more prevalent. And I see this growing in the future. It's the whole distributed green energy movement. Recently here in the United States, we've had a new bill signed to incentivize going solar and bringing solar panels to rooftops everywhere to have solar power in your house, et cetera. Uh, but there's also initiatives to get off of natural gas fueled heating. And I know this is a big issue across Europe, but it's a big issue everywhere. In the United States, we're looking at transitioning from leveraging fossil fuels to leveraging more electricity that can be generated through this distributed green energy. As we start talking about the manufacturing and the analytics and the transmission of the data and the logistics in order to be able to do all this, there seems like there's automation opportunities everywhere because this is a huge initiative to replace, say, all the gas boilers, for example, in Europe, right? It's massive. It doesn't happen overnight. Now, going down that path of distributed green energy, I see this even greater need for automation because as these things transition to distributed energy, there's going to need be a need for cooperation and collaboration between the commercially generated power and the distributed power and the analytics that manage them all. So along with all this distribution of the energy and the logistics that make it happen, it sounds like the automation is going to make a big impact as these transitions go forward. Absolutely, Michael. And I, I think at the end, from a, from a natural perspective, it's all about managing the new complexity because it arises completely new process, completely new work which needs to be managed. And people and, and organizations, they have to learn to think digital first before they try to imagine how can I organize things? How can I structure things and how to bring many people in to do the job at the end? Yeah? Uh, we need to think digital first and, and how much we can automate as much as possible. And that's where we really need the skills and the human people to make right and fast and good decisions to execute the things and to make it available for our communities. I think that's the challenge of, of the next decade. All right, that's the end of our part one of this two-part episode. Stay tuned for part two coming soon to the Transform Now podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Transform Now. For more insightful discussions on digital transformation and more, check out our podcast channel where you'll find all of our previous episodes. And to make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you like what you've heard, please leave us a review. For more information about digital transformation and the future of work, check out blueprism.com to learn how SSNC Blueprism's digital workforce is enabling enterprise transformation now.